The first item will be approval of the agenda. Does anybody get any additions? Well, I do. It's for a community grant uh, from Curtis Muse for Drumlin Heights Seniors Girls Basketball. So we'll bring that up. That'll be 11A. 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 Is there any conflicts of interest to be declared tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to presentations. And we have, uh... yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll move to approve. Okay. okay. Move Second. To... All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay. We have a presentation. Emergency medical care. And Jeff Frazier is with us this evening to explain their role. Okay. The floor is yours, sir. Uh, Jay Walker is our regional manager to join me here as well. Thank you. Team. No problem. So firstly, I'd like to uh, thank you for inviting us tonight to speak about an issue which I recognize uh, uh, people are quite passionate about. I hear health care is a big issue, so uh, we're here to address that as best we can from emergency health services tonight. So my name is Jeff Fraser. I'm the director of provincial operations for emergency health services uh, operations for the province. With me is uh, Jay Walker. <coughs> Jay is the regional manager for the Western region, so he's responsible for the paramedic operations in this from uh, about Hubbards to Yarmouth and Yarmouth up to Windsor. And so uh, the two of us tonight will do our best to answer your questions and give you an overview of how our system uh, functions and uh, operates. So as I understand it, uh, there was a concern around an adjustment we had made within our deployment plan here back in uh, February of 2017. And I believe my, my deputy or general manager responded to a media inquiry that uh, it kind of popped up with a lot of concern about the community. So we are often speaking at councils just like this with concerned uh, citizens and councillors and, and the local governance on the administration of emergency health services. It's important that folks understand about a little bit about our system and we're hoping tonight we can give you just a little bit of an insight of what that is. Our, our system design is that no one community in the province has a resource, rather the resources are deployed where there is actual or anticipated demand throughout the province. And that's a system design that we've had in place for the last 20 years. It's our 20th year of operating here in the province. I know it's not the 20th year of operating in, uh, in, the, in West Pubnico as I look at Councillor Digden, but uh, it is the 20th year of what the system design has been within the, uh, within the province. So paramedics, when they come to work, they'll report to a station, a station that they're assigned at, and they'll start their shift in a station and they'll end their shift in a station, but they'll work where the system needs them to work throughout, the, throughout their watch. We have a busy system. Many of you today may have seen a, a, a media article this morning that talked about uh, offload, ambulance offload, and some of the challenges we have within the province and getting our ambulances back. It's a, it's not just an emergency department problem, it's a, it's a complex problem within the system, but it's something that we, that we continually monitor and we work with, and we work with our partners and, uh, at the Department of Health and our partners at the Nova Scotia Health Authority to balance out, but it was one of the many reasons why we made an adjustment in our deployment plan in this area. We're responsible and accountable to the Department of Health and Wellness for uh, the performance of our system, response time performance, clinical performance, the way we, we work with our paramedics and our fleet to minimize things like critical failures. We have a very, very proactive system uh, that's in place. And we are out, there's a very busy system. And the work that's done by our, our, our the men and women of the EHS uh, is, is commendable. Uh, however, we're here tonight because there is a concern that was, was, was brought forward about an adjustment we made. And I think the term that was concerning, as I understand it, and I'm sure you'll, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, was around the term of priority posting. So the system design of the EHS system in Nova Scotia is based upon a public utility model of accountability system or a type of EMS design system that's used in other places throughout North America. And the term priority posting is in the vernacular of the system design, but really it's not that one community is a priority over others, it's rather it's about balanced coverage and how we provide coverage to all our communities across the province. And so we, we took a really hard look at all of our deployment plans, recognizing that we do have these things like these ambulance offloads, which do complicate our ability to get our paramedics back out onto the street. And we look at where our demand is, and we look at what has happened, what is happening, and what can happen. And that's how our system is managed live. 365 days a year, 
seven days a week, 24 hours a day, minute by minute, in our communication center. Moving our resources around to make sure that we have resource available for actual or anticipated demand. And there is a significant accountability that we as an operator have from the Department of Health and Wellness to make sure that we do that on a, on a regular basis. We are not concerned as a system with that accountability um, about, I think West Pubnico is where it popped up. We look at all the communities and we try to balance that coverage and we had to make an adjustment based on what was happening, what is happening and what the potential can happen throughout our system. Anything Jay you want to add at all? No, we can we can open it up to the <coughs> council, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to have questions from councillors, and usually at the end of the meeting we have a question period. But seeing that it's a little different circumstances here tonight, we're going to allow general public, after council has asked their questions, if they have any, to uh, open it up to the floor for for uh, questions and perhaps some short comments. But we got to keep it orderly. Chris, you'll keep track of names. Uh, I think it would be a good idea that people go to the mic and Let's speak. Speak. Let's speak. State their name and uh, for the camera. So as of now, we'll ask councillors if they have any questions. Help me out here. Okay, Councillor Surrett. It's probably in a two-layer form. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Priority posting. Here's what I was saying. An ambulance is in, and I want to say public office, this is where the discussion is. So what was public before to what it is now? Can you explain that to me? Sure. So as our day unfolds and our demand increases, and typically we have more resources on in the day than we do at night because the demand is more during the day. We have a number of resources that we work with, and as the, the resources get assignments, we begin to juggle those ambulances around to cover off multiple communities. And so before uh, the 1st of February, Pubnico, there was an order of the way that we would balance that coverage within all of our communities. And what we did is we changed the Pubnico order a little bit. And so the difference is, is that the ambulance doesn't necessarily sit in Pubnico, just like it doesn't always sit in Windsor or always sit in Colebrook. We move them around to the different points and we use the evidence, which of course is the data, in order to make sure we make a good decision about where to put those resources to be able to meet that actual or anticipated demand. So the change is, is that rather than leave the posting or the balance coverage piece as it was, the demands of the system spoke clearly to us that we needed to make an adjustment in the way that we bring coverage into places like Yarmouth. The busier, the larger areas certainly have more demand, so that's part of what we're balancing. But that also doesn't mean that we have, we abdicate our responsibilities within our rural communities. It is truly about balance. Understanding that something like this is a, is a, we take it very seriously. It is watched and monitored very, very closely. But we have to try different things within our system to use the resources we have the most effectively we can to serve our communities. So that's the difference is we made a change in the way we do a move up or the way we move the resources around. So it is not, I guess my, I thought that the way it was geared up was here's an ambulance in Pubnico, it's always in Pubnico. Now the ambulance is not in Pubnico because it's, it's, it's not stationed anymore in Pubnico. That's, what, that's wrong. My thinking then, I thought the ambulance was there with paramedics there and when there was a call, whether it was in Pubnico or Yarmit, they would go, but the ambulance would come back to Pumniko site it, all the time? Uh, not all the time, not any community. Cause, cause, so the, the ambulance station still remains in Pumniko, and we have no plans to change that at all. But how, that, how the resources are utilized is that, it, no, as I said earlier, no one uh, municipal unit, town, village, community has a resource. It's a pool of resources. And our demand, our demand and the evidence said, we need to make a change here because we're not balancing the community uh, coverage for all the communities. But we are still starting and ending in Pubnico, and when the system isn't ramped up and busy, then they move down and they'll be back in quarters. But that's not uncommon what happens on in St. Bernard and in Windsor and all the other communities across the across the province. Thank you. Councillor Uh I'm just wondering about uh, 
how many, it's been about 12 years that, uh, I don't know if it's EHS or whoever took over, because Hanika was the last, uh, I think the last ambulance that was independent, if that's the correct word. So the numbers of the last 12 years, I'm sure you guys have all that data. Uh, the numbers have, have they stayed the same? Have they gone up? Have they gone down? Have they? Uh, Councilor, in Pumnico specific? Yeah, from, from the base. I, I didn't bring that information with me tonight, but I would, uh, we have felt a volume increase over the last 20 years, and certainly the last 12 will be part of it across the province. We've got, uh, our system is, is busy in Nova Scotia, and so um, I can't speak to, because I did not bring it with me, the actual numbers in Pumnico, but I will say it's the, one of the reasons we made an adjustment in the southwest was because of the volume increases we're feeling throughout the region and throughout the province. But that doesn't really answer my question. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to figure out, you know, if for 12 years, uh, you know, if, if the numbers are you know, the same or a little bit more or less, you know, why all of a sudden, you know, change it now? Uh, you know, and, and I, I appreciate what you're saying about demand, other places, this or that, but, you know, we had it here for 12 years and uh, seemed to be working all right, and all of a sudden, you know, it's just uh, being changed on us. So. So, so to be fair, to make sure I, I do my best to answer your question because I don't have that the actual number in front of me, what I will tell you is that uh, a number of other communities that Pumnico supports across the entire western region, the volume has increased. So I cannot answer the question on okay. whether or not it's increased, but yeah. we're feeling, and that's the and that's the the way our system works. It's not one community gets an increase. Um, it's how we manage the increases with the entire resource spread that we do have. Yeah, so it's, a fair, it's a fair question, so I just don't have it in front Should we of have more resources? Well, more resources doesn't mean necessarily better care, that's for sure. And I think the article that was reported this morning did talk about those challenges within the system. If we, we do add ambulances to the system, uh, and we make sure that those are, those are decisions that are looked at very, very carefully. Uh, there's no doubt we have a, we are in our province that a lot of our demand is it, it exists in the HRM. We do resource uh, the HRM and we resource around the HRM to try to keep our resources balanced across all of our communities. But more necessarily doesn't translate to better. There is a point where you can add resources and you don't really get the return. We're really focused on other things that we're trying to do within the EHS system around community paramedicine, false prevention. Uh, programs to keep vulnerable seniors in their in their housing. That's kind of where our investments are. We're trying to do things. Emergency health services, or emergency medical services, typically they're designed to be reactive. We are spending our efforts in trying to be proactive to keep people out of those things. So that's, that's so that we're going to have calls we're going to do. We're going to have demand increases we're going to do that are going to happen. But we're spending an equal amount of time trying to, trying to work with partners like the health authority, um, partners like Department of Health and Wellness to keep people out of the hospital to begin with. And that's really where our focus is, is on this year. Okay, well that's all fine and dandy, but I'm, I'm a lobster fisherman and I fish out of, of Dennis Point and we fish in the fall, the winter, the spring. Uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking in, in January when everything's frozen and somebody has a, a mishap at Dennis Point, I just Google mapped, uh, you know, Barrington uh, on a you know, regular day it would take you 31 or two minutes uh, that's with no snow or anything. Yarmouth, uh, we're looking at close to 40 minutes. So, you know, you, you add in the time, you know, for, for weather, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the response time is supposed to be, but, uh, you know, if I'm laying there uh, half frozen, uh, you know, just, you know, just a, a concern. And that has happened before, and I'm sure it's going to happen again. So, you know. Uh, yes, Councillor, you know, you're, you're right. We certainly, we, we watch our system live. So there's somebody right now in our communication center looking at uh, what's happening and what potentially can happen. And, 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 the, and our paramedics will tell you they are mobile, providing coverage around all those communities to those points. So we, we can't be everywhere in a province of 52,000 square kilometers everywhere within five minutes. It's just not possible. We put the resources where there is actual or anticipated demand. Care begins, though, when you access the 911 system uh, immediately because somebody is at the other end of the phone in our communication center providing care until the paramedics arrive, so it's part of a system approach. Medical first responders, I, I see a, 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 some folks here tonight from the medical first response community, also partners within, within our system. Yep, fair, fair question, and, and not one I haven't had before, and not an easy one to answer, but the reality is 
that's how we use our resources we, we across the system. Done. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Warden Danny Muse. Um, just a question about okay. I understand that the, the, the ambulance is not going to be stationed there or based there regularly. Is, is it going to be stationed there at times? It, are there times when there's going to be an ambulance sitting at the, at the base in, in uh, Pubnico? Uh, most certainly. Uh, the way our system works is much like a blanket. Uh, and uh, as resources get less and less or more and more, they move around to cover as much territory as possible. So um, <clears throat> when there's capacity in the system, Pubnico is a station that is manned by paramedics. Uh, <clears throat> when there's less resources, is that those resources spread out to cover more area amongst those lesser resources. So when the system's at its normal capacity, yes, there's an, a paramedic uh, unit or ambulance at the station. Okay, so what, what, uh, 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 what decides when there won't be one? Like what? <laughs> is there going to be one there 50% of the time, 80% of the time, or, or, can, or uh, can you answer that? It would be fair to say is that uh, the majority of the time there would be an ambulance of attention to be there. Now, if a public ambulance goes out on an emergency call, that's the beauty of our system and how it works. Another ambulance will spread out and backfill that, that coverage area. So they're always in, in transition. Yes. But isn't that the way the system works now? If, 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 if for some reason, if for some reason uh, the ambulance in Pubnico is out on a call, with the system, that, system they had before, it's out on a call and then nothing to say that there's not going to be another call in that same area. That's right. So you, so get, an, you get an ambulance from another district to come down, is that correct? Another base. If there's access capacity in another community, so a redundancy, that it resource would be shared with the public okay. jurisdiction. But okay. It's busier so, than that. Yes. Is that multiple communities may have to share one resource because it's that busy. And at the times of the increased uh, offload and increased call volumes, it, sometimes it, we, we, we use multiple communities for one vehicle or one paramedic group. Okay. So, so I guess there can be times when the public ambulance is going to be sitting in another base, just sitting there in another base. Almost certainly, uh, it, but another ambulance from another jurisdiction may be sitting in that base. Just because there's a, a paramedic unit in that base doesn't necessarily mean it's from Pubnico. It could be from no. Barrington. It could be from Halifax, the way our system works. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you're, you're relating to the facts of the calls that you're getting. This is, this is how you've decided to make... Uh, make this decision of having a non-priority base, I'm, I'm correct, and through your, your survey or your, your statistics or? We, we, look at, we look at all of our all of our available data to make those deployment decisions. So what, what if our area becomes really, really busy because we have an aging population, so can that change back to a priority base? That's a great question. And, and the, the answer is if there is a demand change, then we have an obligation to go back and make an adjustment. And we, we do that. We make adjustments uh, across the province. It's, it's, it's a fairly regular piece. If things change, then we've got a responsibility to do that. I will tell you, since February until now, we are satisfied with what, what's been put in place. We watch it closely. We have an accountability department of health and wellness. And at the moment, we're, we're comfortable with what we've done within the system. And it's important to understand, again, is that it is a system. It is not a Pubnico or a Windsor or a, a Matagan ambulance. It's a resource within the system and how they're deployed. That, that's the change uh, that happened when the transition occurred uh, a number of years ago. So the answer to your question is if there was a change, a significant change that drove a trend, then absolutely we'd have to review what that change would be and what that trend looks like and make an adjustment. That would be our responsibility and accountability to do that. So why wouldn't you increase your ambulances? Why wouldn't you increase? You say it's not a better. It wouldn't be a better service. But, uh, I'm not sure. We we do we do add resources to the system. It's just to make sure we put those resources in the right place uh, across the system. And Pubnico is not a place where we'd be looking to put a second resource. There's not enough demand for those communities. We did add some ambulances in the western ambulance hours into the western region to support to keep try to our best to keep. Uh, to keep resources um, 
over the last couple of years. We put some in unit hours in Bridgewater. We put some unit hours in Colebrook because, of course, most of the demand provincially is in the city. And that way we could resource out and they could support the communities a little bit better. And it would have us pulling that string a little bit less. But it is, it's a busy system. And it, it's, we're continually have a responsibility to evaluate that. Okay, one more question. Sure. Um, you're depending on other resources in, in within our communities, um, like the first responders. Most of these, these first responders are all volunteer, voluntary people. And a lot of them go fishing or they're working they may not be able to go and, and to assist somebody before you get there. So something happens. Okay. Excellent, <laughs> e excellent, e excellent question, Councillor, and trust me, one I've had many times before. We, we, look, we have a partnership with the, with the Medical First Response Community. There is a program. It is voluntary for the agencies to participate in. Uh, you know, although I do write a desk now, I work years as a paramedic, and there was, uh, it was a, it's a great system to have a, that partnership. I, I agree. Uh, that it is takes a lot for people to be able to, to participate in, in those programs and levels, but it is truly a, a partnership and is done at the department's choice. We don't necessarily impose the HS system upon them to do that work, although we appreciate everything they do for us and they do a lot for us and the communities. Any more questions or comments from council? Councillor Surratt. Uh. Well, you pass you on something here. Let's let's say that one of the ambulances is in Yarmouth, and it's eight at eight o'clock at night, and the all of a sudden the hospital calls. You have to bring a, a patient to Halifax. So they take off. Uh, then uh, that leaves one ambulance in Yarmouth. You need to got two on site. Yes. So let's say then that at nine p.m that there's an emergency in Yarmouth, big accident, that ambulance goes there. This is at 9 p.m. Let's say that at 9.03 in Surrettes Island, there's somebody that falls off a house or whatever, breaks a leg or whatever the case, or has a heart attack, let's say. Can you, can you tell me where that, that... I can give you a bit of a, an oversight on it. Where would that well, next ambulance come from? So I wouldn't decide, and there's not a prescriptive way that would happen, so there's a person in a medical communication center with GPS in every ambulance in the entire province. And when that first ambulance goes out, that person would be looking, forecasting, what happens if another call happens? So the other call happens at 9 o'clock. 30 seconds within that, that, they pick up that phone. They know that that ambulance will be going to this location. So there's another dispatcher looking at all the resources in, in the southwest region and be taking the closest unit to that, regardless of where community it's from, and moving it towards the army. Yes, there would be a delay, because we can't plan for three, three emergencies all in a second, in, a, in an hour. However, the dispatch center looks at these things and these trends, henceforth while we're here today, is talking about movement of resources, and is that ambulance is moving, <clears throat> as soon as that second call goes out, another call, ambulance is coming from another jurisdiction. It could be from Matagan, it could be from Pumdico, it could be one here in Tuscan that was on its way to Halifax and we turned it around, right? So it doesn't matter where that ambulance is from, the most appropriate ambulance is dispatched to cover as much geography as we can. If, if it was like it is, it, it has been in Publico, that ambulance being in Publico could reach our place in 30 minutes where Digby or Barrington would take it off. Yeah, uh, well, if that ambulance was in Pumniko, of course. It's yeah, with our system the way it is today, that ambulance would likely be between halfway between Mintagan and Yarmouth or halfway between uh, Pumniko and Yarmouth cover. because there's a dispatcher looking at all the resources and sharing those resources equally. Rather than <clears throat> in, the, in the past, that ambulance would stay in Pumniko until it was required. We're actually using the resources as evenly as possible. Thank you. Anybody else? I do, but I don't know. I think probably Digby was ahead of Council. Yes, please. I uh, just have a statement to read out here that I uh, made for this evening, wrote up. Mr. Warden, fellow councillors, Mr. Fraser, Mr. Walker, and public. A brief history of the ambulance service in West Pubnico. There has been an ambulance working out of Pubnico for approximately 50 years. 
In the early years, the ambulance service was an association consisting of a board of directors with members of the communities it served and who felt very strongly about having a community ambulance service serving the Pubnicos and the Argyles. The ambulance service received monies from the province of Nova Scotia to operate, but when it was time to purchase a new ambulance, a telethon was held and fifteen to twenty thousand dollars was raised in an afternoon. The first defibrillator purchased by the West Pubnico Ambulance Service was raised by monies from a bowlathon held in the community. Great community support. In 2004, the ambulance service was integrated into the emergency health services, which serves Nova Scotia and was managed by, is managed by emergency medical care. West Pubnico Ambulance Service was the last service in Nova Scotia to be taken over in this new system. It was publicly stated at the time that the Pubnico Ambulance Service would always remain a priority service, both by EMC and EHS personnel. This service has worked very well, but earlier this year, word got out that the Pubnico base would no longer be a priority base. To my understanding, this means that the VHS Pubnico is required in other areas for either calls or coverage. There may be no ambulance to serve the Pubnicos and Argyles, which could create a delay in response times to an emergency medical, uh, uh, medical emergency, sorry. From Yarmouth Base, the Pubnico base is 40 kilometers, and from Barrington Base, the Pubnico base is 34 kilometers. Another 10 kilometers can be added to these numbers to reach the end of Lower West Pubnico. I have heard, as a municipal councillor, that since this new system has been implemented, that some people have been waiting longer for an ambulance in medical emergencies. My speaking on this issue is by no means a personal attack on EMC or EHS. I have worked for EMC for 12 years and they have been a great employer. I love my profession as a paramedic, but I feel as though I have to represent the concerns of my constituents as a counselor. In closing, Marilyn Pike, Senior Director of Emergency Health Services stated publicly in 2004, Mr. Dontremont, which was our manager at the time for the ambulance service in Pumnico, his staff and the association have done an excellent job in serving this community for many years. We look forward to building on the good work. We look forward to building on that good work. I ask, with EHS Pubnico Ambulance becoming a non-priority, are we actually building on what it once was? One year ago, while campaigning, I made one promise to the people of District 8. That was, I would do the best that I can for them, and I feel as though I have to speak up on such a serious issue. Thank you. I am speaking tonight as a counselor for the residents of the municipality of Argyle. Thank you. Do you want to say something? I, I just, just a couple of clarity questions, if you don't mind. No. Go ahead. Um, I'm not a counselor. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so, so, so you, so the, the decision was made on on data um, that would provide, you know, facts facts around volume and what the volume uh, impacts are across the region. Um, I guess not having the data here, it's difficult for us to have a conversation. Um, I, I, I think, you know. Um, would have been interesting to have that information here tonight, but you don't have it, so there's not much we can do about that. Um, so, so I wondered what the average response time in the Pubnico area was before, and what the average response time it is now, based on that change, and what is your standard response time, and how did this decision change that? Great question. Great question. Yeah, excellent question. Uh, Sir, I think what we'll do is we'll just to make sure we can get the information as accurate. We'll open that up as what's called a service inquiry, and we'll write back in writing the answer to your question. How would that be? What would lay it out? So, I, I think it would be very important for the residents of Pubnico in particular to have that information, okay. and if you can provide that data, because there's some very uh, engaged and intelligent residents of Pubnico that 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 might look at that information and and ask uh, further probing questions. Uh, for instance. Did the data consider the fact that the that there is probably 
the most activity at the wharf in Dennis Point, and, and there's two other wharves not far away from there. Did the data anticipate the kinds of services or, or, um, or health-related services that could occur there? Did that impact the data? Did the fact that there is uh, three doctors in the Pubnico area that operate either, either public or private clinics impact that decision to move that service away, or was it not considered? Um, if it wasn't considered, perhaps perhaps that's something we could bring to the table for you if it was information that you did not consider in those types of decisions. Um, I think it's fair. Uh, we, uh, we know that, that with an aging demographic, uh, the, the demand for services is going to increase everywhere, not just Pubnico. I, I, I understand that and respect that. But I, I just, like, I guess I'm asking, uh, is there any data that you would require from the community that could help you make that decision, or are you just strictly using your, your numbers to make that decision? I'll answer, uh, I can only answer a part other than what I committed to, is we'll, we'll, we'll respond formally back to the question on the, okay. on the uh, performance through Department of Health. To be clear though, we're not removing the ambulance from the community. So some of the things uh, uh, Mr. Muse you spoke about, we would look at if we were totally removing the station and the Publico unit, those would be a number of the factors. This is just a change in the way we're deploying the unit. So right. some of those things we would look at and some of those things wouldn't be rele relevant to, it, to what is happening within the entire deployment piece. So we do, do, we do as I mentioned before, we look retrospectively at what has happened. Uh, there is a, we have a very data-rich system, and, and, our, and we've got a very, very tight accountability with Department of Health around our response time criteria within our communities. Right. The, uh, the other thing is we look at what is happening, what is going on. Are we seeing more transfers into the hospital? Uh, what is our offload times? What are the factors that are happening? Are we participating in critical care strategies like STEMI or heart attack, uh, trip destinations, trauma destinations? Those are all a part of it. And then what potentially can happen? What if we get busier? How are we going to make an adjustment? And so some of the things that you asked about are good questions, but the relative if we were looking to remove an ambulance totally from a community, which is clearly not what, we're, what we were doing here. So I, uh, we will respond, though. I think it's best. And I mean, rather than me try to go from, from, uh, from memory, that's a good question. And it really, re it really requires a written response so that you can is there a timeline where that response would come back to us? Yep, we close uh, service inquiries within two weeks, 14 okay, days. That's okay, that's reasonable. Yep. Um, just one other question of clarity around around the data. The, the data, I'm sure the data anticipates the severity of of the cases that that occur in regions. I'm, I'm assuming that that is something that gets considered or. There, there are, you know, not, not all part of our, of our operation is predictable, obviously. There's a lot of things you can't predict that happen, but there are a number of things you can predict that happen. And so about 47% of what we do are, is very predictable. It's our inter-facility transfer work, and that has a bearing on how we deploy our vehicles throughout the day. So um, there are a number of data points that are looked at. We, we do do some modeling when we look. And so this, this change we made uh, this year was looked at, Jay, probably for about a year. 215 is when we began to look at all of our deployment plans again and looking at how we how are we best using our vehicles to serve all of our communities. So it's uh, it's not something we just pull um, 40 weeks off and make a decision. It's something we look at. And it, our system is a system. It's, it's You pull one thing, it's hooked to a string. So there's a certain number of things that we anticipate that are going to happen. And there's some things we have to make adjustments for afterwards that we didn't anticipate. That are part of it, and it, it goes back to uh, Councillor LeBlanc's question: If we saw something different, would we do something different? And the answer would be absolutely. So that's that's a part. So, with inside inside of two weeks, we'll answer we'll answer the question around the performance, the before and after piece, okay. as part of our accountability, and that that'll uh, that'll we'll we'll work with Department of Health and getting that back out to you. So so I'm, I think I'm pushing my luck. On, on a follow-up question. So this is uh, for sure the last one. The warden is going to shut me down for sure. Yeah. <laughs> he should probably do that. Um, so so uh, one last thing. So, so it's a non-priority. Obviously, you know, the infrastructure of EHS is like, I, th I think the important uh, piece is the response time. That's what people will be most fearful of is, is what is the, how is that going to impact response time? Uh, being one ambulance in, the, in that particular uh, location, it's, it's hard for us to understand that that would, would be better. But uh, I guess my, my question is, is, is where, because it's not a priority station, and I realize you can't answer this completely, but what would the range 
B of this ambulance. So now that it's not a priority status, I'm presuming that it's a roamer, that it roams, that it doesn't actually stay in one place. So how far does it roam? A good question. Depends. All of our vehicles are roamers. So remember I said paramedics start and end at a station? but they are deployed where there's demand or anticipated demand, so they're, they're moving all day long. So with tonight, after the system begins to settle down and some of those transfers go away and a lot of our call demand and people are home, we do less. And so it's more likely that there'll be an ambulance in uh, the Pubnikos than there would be probably today at 3 o'clock when we'll be covering off more communities because the system gets busy. But to give you an absolute answer of what that would be would be very, very difficult because there is no one community that has one resource. It's for all of them. And the, the adjustment, in this case, painted a very clear picture for us that we needed to make this adjustment to provide balanced coverage. And it's unfortunate, I think I talked about the vernacular. The priority, non-priority, I've been in our system for 28 years, and the last uh, eight as the director, it never occurred to me before because it's part of our vernacular, the priority, non-priority, until this particular issue bubbled up about how that word is looked at because I think people felt that it's but really it's the vernacular comes from the system design but really it's about balanced coverage that's what it is about balancing the coverage for all the communities it just never occurred to me about what an uh, what, an, what, what an upsetting term that was outside of our industry so to speak so uh, and certainly one that we'll make sure that we make a change in because it's not that Pubnico or Yarmouth or Matagan or anywhere else is not a priority. They're all a priority to us. But we have so many resources, and we have to use those resources as best we can. And when we don't have enough resources, then we add. So Jay and his team sometimes will look at our demand patterns and add ambulances on the day. We'll do call-ins. And some of these things are influenced by environmental factors. Weather, uh, we'll ramp up for weather. We ramp up the system when there are hospital closures that are going to impact a number of communities. and what that means. So th those things happen live and we kind of roll them out. And I think I mentioned earlier we'd added some resources in our region to take some pressure off uh, throughout, throughout all the communities. But yeah, that, that's the key. I think that term is probably uh, a little misleading about, about that piece. So it is about balanced coverage, not necessarily about priority. Just a minute. Um, well, I have a lot better understanding. Thank you for your presentation. Now we'll entertain a few questions uh, from people in the audience, if they wish. And I see that, that um, Jill. One question for Jill. Uh, Jill Bo from East Pamlico. I got one question. You were there. At, I moved down here in Nova Scotia in 2001. Is data include the MFR, the um, uh, of MFR in the region? You guys think this year? Because when I moved down to East Pondicourt, they have no MFR. West Pondicourt don't know how many they have in 2001. And now they get more and more people. Does that include, does that go any your information on that one? Yeah, <laughs> So, so in our accountability department, health and wellness, the medical first response uh, component is not a factor in the response time at all. So although we, I can't stress how happy we are to have that partnership, uh, the MFR on scene times are not a part. We don't dispatch uh, med medical first responders. We notify them of an emergency in their community. But our accountability starts when the phone picks up and stops when the paramedic crew arrives on scene. And, it, and the MFR, the medical first response, is not captured in that data. We do not factor that in. Sometimes we get call at night, 911, but not an alarm back on old people and stuff like that. And we talk to the people, and they feel better. Don't call the ambulance. Don't call 911 on that. So a few times we get up and back for that. So I want to make sure I understand the questions. The question is sometimes locally, people will reach out to you. Uh, as opposed to calling 911. So, of course, we wouldn't know that information to be able to factor that in. So, you know, our, our, our take on that is we encourage all residents to call 911 for an emergency. Remember, care begins when you access the 911 system. So, no, the answer would be unless we knew that was happening, we would not know that would be a factor. Sometimes they get old people, panic button, they call it. And they 
they call, they're gonna call me on night, something like that. But then I go there and just talk to them. Do you need I don't know, I don't know, but you know, you talk to him, you calm down. So that's why you get less call on that one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Richard, thank you. Uh, Chris, you have somebody else? Go ahead, Mr. Prouty. Hey, Richard. Craig Prouty from Pumdico. Yeah, pick it up. Uh, just a couple, probably, points or questions. Um, I find it, living in Pumdico, I, what you've done to the ambulance, I personally find it as a direct insult to the people who live there. And I actually find it a direct insult to the people in the neighboring communities. Because I've listened to you explain your things, how the ambulance was moved around. And I think the ambulance, under the other situation, it was moved around some. I think the point is it doesn't come back. I'm told the ambulance sometimes goes to Barrington and just sits there. Or Garmouth and just sits there. I'm thinking, wasn't it back in Pumnico? Uh, there are tons of businesses in Pumnico. There are 250 lobster boats. There are five or six major wharves. The majority of the ground fish in Atlantic Canada is landed in Pumnico Harbor. Uh, there are scallopers, saners, numerous fish plants. Um, I would think if there's lots of seniors, if there was a community that should have an ambulance, I would think that would stand out as a shining example. Now, I heard you say you move it around. If there's other communities that need an ambulance, I don't understand why we're not contemplating adding. Why do you take away in healthcare? The province is getting older. Um, the age demographic, we have less young people. I've heard, you seem to be relying on uh, first responders. I heard a lot of them, they have other jobs. You guys are paramedics. That is your only job. That's what people expect an ambulance to come. I know uh, response times matter. Uh, my grandmother had fallen down with a heart attack a number of years ago, and if under the president situation we have today, she would have died, because that ambulance was there probably five or six minutes. If it was 30 minutes, she'd be dead. I feel that we've probably been lucky not to lost people. And I mean, I, I don't know, maybe we have. Maybe you guys are too slow getting somewhere. I'm not, I'm not sure for that information. You don't seem to have it, or not tonight. But I, I really find it a, an insult to the community. I mean, in Woods Harbor, I've seen our ambulance go to Woods Harbor, I've seen it go all over the place. But I think robbing an ambulance from a community is wrong. And it would be, I don't care what community it is, it's wrong. I think the decision was wrong. You said about priority, non-priority. The difference is it doesn't have to come back. And with the bulk of the population in Pumnick and Argyle, it makes up a fair amount of this municipality. Uh, I, I think, I, I just cannot fathom how you guys have come up with this, this farce. I'm gonna call it a farce. I think the ambulance should be how it was. And I don't think people in Pumnico, or Argyll, or the neighbor communities should let it lie till the ambulance is back how it was pre-February. And you're not going to convince me, and I think we're probably going to have people die because somebody in Halifax has made a decision to play with the scheduling. And I'm not, and I'm assuming this is probably happening all over Nova Scotia. If you're playing with other routes, I think you're putting people's lives at risk, especially with the state of the emergency rooms. And I know there's people that sometimes go to these ambulance stations to talk to paramedics. And if there's no paramedic there, what happens to them people? So. And as he pointed out, sometimes the calls that you probably should get aren't getting because someone's calling the fire department or doctor. And maybe I guess people just start calling the ambulance, 911. Use the puppy. Because uh, I, I, live, I live a few houses away from the ambulance station and I don't notice any difference in the ambulance leaving that it ever did. It goes out quite a bit. So you're not going to convince me that uh, what you've come up with is the right decision. So I guess that's more of my statement there. So. Thank you. Thank Brad. you. Chris, uh, Dr. Loveridge, you yeah. like to speak? Oh. oh. After. Sorry. I'm, I'm Beatrice Goodwin from Argyle Sound. 
and I want to explain to you that I have a problem with my neck and my shoulders. And in March 2014, my husband went into cardiac arrest. And had it not been the fact that the ambulance arrived there in eight minutes, I would not have been able to continue CPR on my own. And I've read that uh, less than three minutes is usually the maximum time that uh, CPR can be performed by one person for, for that amount of time. And uh, I was able to do it for the eight minutes, but I was in a lot of pain by the time Glenn got there. And the first responders didn't get there till after that. And I'm sure, positively sure, that if the ambulance had arrived a half an hour later, my husband wouldn't have been there and I would have been in going on the ambulance. So I don't believe that all this shifting around and taking an ambulance out of where it is now and floating it wherever they're going to float it is the proper thing for West Pubnico. It Using that for a base and going between West Pubnico and Yarmouth or West Pubnico and Barrington or areas in between is fine, but taking it out of there and floating it in Matagan or on its way to Halifax or wherever it may be, lives are going to be lost. And I'm just glad my husband wasn't one of them. Thank you. Chris, um, next to Dr. Loveridge. And after um, Chris, did you get somebody else? Elaine Surrett. Elaine Surrett? Is it named Chris? I am. He is. Okay. I got a good helper. Yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, many of you know me, but I'm sure these guys don't. Uh, but so I will introduce myself. I've been in practice here. I shall shortly be starting my 44th year here. Uh, I was the de facto or the actual. Uh, medical director of the West Public Ambulance Service for more than three decades. Uh, I remember all this stuff only too well. The first case when uh, Dr. Stewart got in charge of the Department of Health, he created EHS, which was not a bad thing. However, at the time, um, we didn't really trust Halifax any more than we trust them now. And so we stayed independent for quite a few years. And as uh, Glenn has said, we had the clear indication at the time that we became not independent that we would remain uh, as we were. Now, gentlemen, however you, however you sort of spin this, whatever things you say about response times, which you don't have, or usage or anything, this is a reduction in service. You cannot deny that. It is a reduction in service. Now, I've been at the side of the road with seriously ill people with very limited equipment waiting for ambulances. It's not pleasant. If you're eight minutes, if you have a heart attack and you're going to V-fib, eight minutes is all you've got. Uh, so <coughs> no one's going to come from Barrington in eight minutes. Uh, um, there's also something you have forgotten about or you've chosen not to say. Uh, there are now a large number of people who were transferred from hospital in Yarmouth to other hospitals in the province because our services have been very severely cut back over the last two decades. If you get kidney stone, you have to go to Kentville. If you get a broken hip, you have to go to Kentville or Halifax. If you have a pediatric crisis because we now have no pediatricians, you have to go to the IWK. Almost always these people are in an ambulance and these trips are long. The thing is gone all day. Uh, and so what you should be doing is you should be sort of, uh, we should not be having less services, we should be having more. Uh, I'm well aware of some of the problems with sort of, for example, um, at the two major hospitals in Halifax, there are ambulances that sit there waiting for six hours at a time day in and day out. You guys should address that. I don't care who sort of um, uh, feathers you have to ruffle on and that. And I'll say something as a rural resident. Um, we've, uh, 
Over the last three decades, we've seen <coughs> continuous erosion of the services we have provided to us by various levels of government. Uh, um, and as this municipality in particular, this municipality has the highest per capita contribution to the gross provincial product of any rural municipality in the province. Uh, we deserve better. We also have the worst physician shortage in the province. It's worse than Cape Breton here. Uh, so what's going to happen when there's no, when there's no paramedics and stuff, um, when they're in Barrington, when they're in Matagan, uh, when they're sort of uh, sitting at a hospital ER waiting for someone to say they can go? Um, we're all obviously going to have to sort of, uh, we, we're going to be less. And uh, um, I would suggest to, to my <coughs> councillors here, they, they might consider the sort of distribution of AEDs around the joint because if you haven't got one, you haven't got one and you won't get one. Uh, um, and so, so, so I'm disappointed in this. I, I don't think it was handled well. The communication was abysmal. There had been no communication with the physicians in this area at all. Uh, and I think you, you, you need to give us a better explanation. So I won't carry on. I mean, that's all I have to say. Okay, at this, uh, Chris. There's, two, there's three more. Elaine's next, yeah, you say? Right. Uh, Who's next? Oh, you want to go before me? Yeah, no, there's there's three people, sorry. Okay, so I'm the up and the phone. Yeah, Blair. Can I put my name there? Just you did, yeah. Just okay. Hey, Earl, did you get your name down? No. No. <laughs> okay, I'll ask people that are at the mic, if you add something new, just, we can't be going over the same repetitive stuff. So if you have something new, you're more than welcome to say, but we, we can't go all night of repeating the same stuff over again. Okay? Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Elaine Surrett. I am here to add my voice to those advocating for a return to the system, the ambulance service system, um, as it was uh, before February. I understand fully um, maintaining effectiveness in the business. I'm a small business owner, so that part of it I do, I do understand. I also am familiar with the ambulance uh, system in the way that it was set up, so I'm not quite certain if I understood correctly this evening that um, when you speak about blanket coverage, it was my understanding that that's what it was already. So. Um, except that the ambulance would probably move to East Pubnico sometimes, and some of the times it would move to Pubnico Head in order to better address uh, different calls as opposed to being in Yarmouth. So I'm not sure if I'm, I'm not that clear as to what impact um, the changes will have actually have on the system. I do know that uh, in reality, when you make changes and diminish services, reduce services, there is bound to be an impact. So it's, it's, it's a little um, inconceivable that we as members of the community would not feel someone, somewhere, sometime in the communities of West Pompico, East Pompico, Argyle, Argyle Sound, uh, would not feel, have, be impacted directly. And I'm just going to close by just saying that on a personal note, five years ago, my husband suffered a heart attack. The ambulance was at my house in um, five or six minutes. And I know that's not always possible. I understand. However, uh, today he would not be alive if we had not had that ambulance. It was in January to comp for the compound the problem um, uh, for an ambulance to come from Yarmouth or Barrington is is um it's it's it doesn't compare to having the service directly there in west Pubnico as it was so that's it i'm hoping that you will reconsider and consider the 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 as uh, dr loveridge said the rural communities have um a shortage of doctors already so the ambulance is just compounding the problem the 
loss of or the reduction in ambulance service is already compounding the problem. So thank you. Thank you. Chris, who was right. uh, If I may, can I say a little bit more about that evening? Sure. Because a heart attack, not only did he have a heart yeah. attack. He went into complete cardiac, total cardiac arrest in our sitting room. So uh, the, the medics were there. I'm like Beatrice, I would have been able to for a few minutes, but certainly not for 40 minutes. And we were lucky, uh, it was in January, we were lucky the roads were dry that night. But I hate to think of what would happen if it was uh, in a, um, in a, you know, this bad weather, bad roads condition. So, yeah. Thank you. Arnold Thank Mews. you. Arnold Muse is next. Thank you very much, gentlemen. My name is Arnold Muse. What I'm looking at here is something brand new that nobody thought about or brought about. It seems to me that five years ago, the West Pomnico Fire Protection Association, which is the owners of the West Pomnico Fire Department, came up and spent $100,000 to set up a first responder vehicle, including the training of people like my nephew over here. And when you saw that, you guys, you said, mm-hmm, we'll cut the service of the ambulance down since they have somebody already there. Pardon me, that's what you did. Thank you. Blair. My name is Blair Donchemo. I've been in the fire department for 28 years, and um, I'm in charge of the medical first responders at our station. I have noticed in the past year that our call volume has gone up because there's not an ambulance in the base. So they're calling us out more. And the wait times are getting longer. This is true. I there, I'm in the field, I've seen it. i seen one time we waited 35 minutes for an ambulance to come to our call. And that never happened before. But what you guys are not understanding is before that, I knew that our ambulance would leave. Woods Harbor would come up. Woods Harbor Station is a non-priority station. It always has been never was a priority station. So they were losing their service because of us. So I don't think it was fair for them that they were losing their ambulance to us. But I'm just, that's an example. But what else I have to say? Uh, when we signed up for MFRs, they promised us that they would not change the priority of our ambulance base. And here we are. They changed it on us. And they're calling out more. So I don't know what, how we can solve this, but I did sign up for MFRs to benefit the community. I know it's a good thing. I mean, we're not, we don't have the skills the paramedics have, but we can definitely help out. If you're waiting for an ambulance, you want someone to come. No matter who it is, just to hold your hand or say everything's going to be all right. I'm just saying, that's what I'm saying, I guess. So mm -hmm. I don't know what else I can add to it, but let me think. And it's true, there's not always an ambulance from this area. Like we wanted to call a couple weeks ago in Argyle, and the ambulance was from Bridgewater, but it was there. It was there within 10 minutes. I'm not taking cheap shots to you guys. I'm just saying how, what I'm seeing was everything in the field as an MFR. But it was there. I'm not complaining it was from Bridgewater, but it was there within 10 minutes. So, but the wait times are getting harder. I'll tell you that. So that's all I have to say. Sasha. Sasha. I'm Sasha Turgeon from West Pubnico. So I was talking to Glenn last night on Facebook, and I said, I hope I'm not coming here tonight to be told that the cut in the service was going to make her life better. And from you, this is oh, the only thing I actually got. You came here with no data, so we are all came here to find out what is you know, the wait time, all of that, those are important things. You know, those are things that matter. And showing up here tonight without those data just prove how little you care about what it is that we need. That's all I have to say. John, Doug. Oh, Doug? Last one is Doug. One more. My name is Doug Bort. I used to work for these guys for 28 and a half years until uh, we had a call 
from Barrington in Chester, where I tore the tendon off my arm, bone off my arm. Um, what I'm going to get at here is there has been an increase in RDU transfers, uh, but there's no extra. Are you guys looking at something off a transfer units, especially up the Liverpool way? And anything along that line that would free up an actual unit, like with actual paramedics on it that they can do the calls, you know what I'm saying, I'm coming to? Is there anything in the plans for that? Because if you start taking ambulances off the road to do RDU transfers, and there is plenty when I left, when I was out, there was plenty coming out of, out of Liverpool, all right? So you've got three or four that are tied up. I know that sometimes the dispatcher will hold off on the RDU transfer because there are emergency calls coming up. But if you had different units that are specifically made to do transfers, I know there's one in, in, there's one in Yarmouth, a transfer unit, but I mean actual, these guys can get away from doing actual transfers and do the, the, these guys do the transfer. You're sitting in the back of a rig. You might need APs, ACPs, you might not. But is there anything in the works that looks like it's going to be leaving the crews that are now do their actual paramedic work and then the, the other crews that are doing transfers? And it will free up something. Thanks, uh, thanks for the question, Doug. So we're continually looking at our system. I think I talked about you know, close to 47% of what we do every day is transfer work, inter-facility transfer work, um, taking people to other hospitals, as doc, the, the doctor had alluded to. It's a part of what we do. We, are, uh, we did add a multi-patient transfer unit in Yarmouth a number of years ago. We continue to work towards a split production model of, uh, and taking a careful look at the work that the EHS does. There are probably is a lot of transfers that could be handled a different way. And those are part of the strategies that we continue to work with Department of Health and Wellness on building. Um, that's probably the best way, Doug, other than that we continue to evaluate and look for those opportunities. Okay. One more question. I asked this a year ago. MFRs get on scene. Paramedics get on scene. They require two paramedics between themselves in the back of the rig is an MFR who has a proper license allowed to drive the ambulance and is it going to change? Um, you never got back to me. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, the, uh, it, it, the answer was clear the first night. You, you were looking for a cir uh, circumstance specific to you, but generally, if there's a, a mass casualty or a disaster, there is an exception to that rule that has to be uh, updated through the, the regional management for permission for that to happen. And so it depends. Well. And, well, mass casualty. Well, the regional manager is typically on the phone in, in, in minutes, right? Mm -hmm. so there's always one on duty. Oh, specifically, can I jump in? Well, that's a specific question that we have to take offline because it's your medical yeah. issue. Right? Yeah. So I can't. Let's I stay can't, on topic, please. I can't no, get into it. Right. And you guys can talk about this no, afterwards that's or that's all I in have. private. Judy Surratt. Judy Surratt? Just a <coughs> quick response to your how long you have to wait for an ambulance. This happened to us just a few weeks ago. We called uh, the ambulance from my father who's 96 and we've called many times. And many times the ambulance has been there in 5, 7, 10, even 15 minutes. But this time was well over 30 minutes. And we were patiently waiting and he did suffer a small heart attack. Uh, he's in hospital now. So this happened to us recently about response time. I just wanted to say that. And I have a letter from a friend, and I'll leave it to you to read uh, whenever. He sent me this letter to give to you guys, so, okay? Thank you. So that's it for me, thanks. Thank you. Why didn't they call us to go? That's what I don't understand. Uh, yeah, we didn't call nobody. We waited for the ambulance. Yeah, but usually they call. Yeah. They call us. I don't know. I don't know. We, uh, 
we have a letter, we, we, we have another Brian de Altamont. And I would, at this time I'd ask to see Al to read this letter we received that he wanted read tonight. We sure. thought it was you at first, Brian, but another <laughs> this is, one. Blair, Blair. Blair, I mean. This is another. <laughs> <laughs> well, Blair, but yeah, I know. Understandable mistake. <laughs> uh, so this is Brian B. Dantremo. Uh, and it's written by him regarding removal of the EHA's base from priority to non-priority. I was recently informed that the decision has been made to change the status of the West Pontico Ambulance Base to a non-priority base. I do not recall any consultation from EHS or EMC with the people of West Pontico and surrounding areas prior to this change. For many years, the ambulance service based in West Pontico was operated by the West Pontico Ambulance and Funeral Sur Services Association. <clears throat> I would also like to remind you all that our ambulance service in West Pontico was the last ambulance service provider in the province to transition from private to current service of EHS. The main reason we are reluctant of any change was the idea of having to accept a non-priority ambulance service from the provincial ambulance service provider and to have less input in the operations of the service. I was part of the negotiating team and I recall that the major item left on the table after months of negotiations was to recognize the West Pumnico base as a priority base. In early 2004, West Pumnico Ambulance and Funeral Services Association was granted the priority base designation and the board of directors and members of the community voted unanimously <coughs> to accept the transition. On April 23rd, 2004, there was an announcement stating that the transition was to take place for the next few months, with West Pubnico being a priority base. I don't recall that the promise of a priority base was only for 13 years. What's next? In another 13 years, are you planning to shut down the West Pubnico base completely, and likely with no consultation with the community? I urge you to have a good look at this part of the province. We are very few areas in this province that have such a bustling industry with actual growth during the past few years. The success in the lobster industry has created an increase in activity for many spin-off businesses such as boat building, carpenters, and all the other tradespeople. <clears throat> if anything, there are more there is more of a reason for West Pumnico to be priority based in 2017 than it was in 2004. I trust that you and your colleagues will have a good second look at your decision on the West Pumnico base. As you know, we are positioned in a small point of land in southwest Nova Scotia. Please don't make us more isolated. Respectfully submitted, Brian Donsmo, former president of the West Pumnico Ambulance and Funeral Services Association. So, letter submitted for your information. Chris, Paula, please. Paula. Yeah. Hello, my name is Paula McQuinn. I'm from West Pumnico. I've lived there for 35 years. I have a list. Some of them have already been addressed, thankfully. Um, the one point I do make is the fact, if I, um, I, I guess a little bit of history. I manage a fish processing facility. Sometimes I have up to 40 to 50 employees. So we often have mishaps, knife cuts, blood, fainting, you name it. So I have three or four main first aiders on site. But what's happening, the first aiders are now getting more and more scared of being the one responsible, the front line, to take care of stuff. On the last incidents, we had one faint in convulsions. The ambulance was called, but it took a fair amount of time. The concern we have for our first aid responders on site is that if the priority changes and we have to have longer times, they're not willing to put themselves out. But by the labor code standards, we are required to have them, becoming increasingly more difficult to say, okay, sure, take a first aid course, learn what you need to do, but no, I'm not going to do that if it's the risk of a 16-year-old in convulsions and you know, I'm not going to make it and I'm going to be responsible. In this close-knit community, we really do fear that we're not going to have that urgent response. And I think it's very important. Um, I have a lot more notes. A lot of it was already addressed. <coughs> but peak times, like Calvin mentioned, join Lobstream, join the height of the drag season, which we are in now. Um, <coughs> The uh, Coast Guard manages to bring a helicopter on site. Um, maybe it's a, a possibility to be more proactive and get more ambulances in the area during these peak times because there are a lot of workers out there and there are a lot of accidents that are happening. That's, I guess, all I have to say and thanks for your time. Thank you, Paula. <laughs> Joe? Yeah. Dion? Any more after Joe? Joe, you're last. Good evening, everybody. I'm Joe Dion, Chief East Pontico Fire Department. I'm just gonna, I just got some call times here. With one call we had here last spring. 
2355 to call coming to HS or roll over. Our dispatch was not notified right away. <coughs> we got the gauge at 0, 0, 100 hours. My, one of my guy, first responders was on scene within two hours. I was on scene within five. Ambulance, where I sit, there's a station 10 minutes to either side of me. My ambulance came from Barrington 35 minutes after the call came in. Now, if there had been a serious accident, what would have happened? As it was, she wasn't hurt. She managed to crawl out through the window herself because we had to call what come to go for her jaws. We canceled them because we didn't have to use them. My question is, how long is too long of a wait? That night, it was snow. The RCMP said the best they could do was 50 kilometers an hour. The ambulance driver even told me it was 50 kilometers, 50 to 80 maximum on the highway from Barrington. Because Woods Harbor or West Punjab Harbor, neither one were available for us. And like I say, they sit 10 minutes away from either side of me. And like I say, I don't know what would have been result would have been if it had been something serious. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One redress from where you're standing. Okay. Uh, I have one question. Is it true that the public ambulance leaves the community and goes to, let's say, Barrington and goes there and that ambulance is out of service, the nurse is covering that base? Um, Can I ask you the question? Because I know the answer. So. Yep, for sure. Um, like any uh, any uh, emergency service, people are, we have humans working, and sometimes they're sick, sometimes we can't get staffing, and sometimes we need to shut down an ambulance. And when that happens, is that we try our best to fill those ambulances with the, with the resources that we have, and it's hard to get people to to work on our urgent notice. Uh, and if that happens, we again spread out the resources the most appropriate way, just like we do when we run low resources. If we we go down an ambulance, much like emergency rooms close because there's not lack of nurses or doctors, it happens on short notice, and that's why that would happen. Uh, just one, I actually find since you guys are in the business of emergency health services. Uh, I can understand the emergency department of hospital because we have a shortage of doctors. We do not have a shortage of paramedics in Nova Scotia. <clears throat> so I find it alarming that you're taking a Punico ambulance or any ambulance to another community and you're saying that that ambulance is in stock. I've not once read the wrong parents and said we have a shortage of paramedics in Nova Scotia. So I, I find that it backs up my first point. Uh, EHS it's a private business contracted by the province of Nova Scotia to run health services. And it comes back to the point of what I made first. This is clearly a budget profit issue. And that is unacceptable. And I think this council and other councils of the province, if this company is so concentrated on the profit, that's what I'm hearing, it's ambulances and paramedics, and they're not in the shortage. And <coughs> I would think paramedics are like nurses that could call them to the hospital. I know lots of nurses that could call them once on the hospital. So, of all the government is, it's a budget issue with you guys. You can call it what you want. I think it's a budget issue. And I believe you're going to put people's lives in jeopardy. And I've heard numerous instances where people would have died, and they're going to die. And you guys, or your bosses, uh, should be held responsible. So, uh, I guess my point is, so you asked the thing that I feared most of your, you know, almost like you're sort of robbing Peter to pay Paul. I guess that's an old statement, but I think that's but really summed this up. You're robbing Peter to pay Paul. It has nothing to do with service levels. You're, just, you're stealing from one community, and that's what you do. And I think it's happening all over Nova Scotia. And I think it's wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And that's, so I guess that's my point. You guys are robbing Peter to pay Paul, and there's no way you can explain that. Okay. Okay, well. Bring it to an end. I think the issue has been well discussed and, and all concerns brought out, and we'll move forward from here. Uh, 
I'd like to thank Mr. Frazier for coming and all the people. At, Go ahead. At this time, uh, I'd like to take a five minute break before we move on and give time for the for uh, people to move out. And question period at the end of the meeting will still be available, but I we done it now because I assume a lot of these people would like to leave and not set through the whole meeting. But anybody watching on YouTube, if there's any questions on other issues or perhaps even this issue, we'll try to address them without Mr. Fraser. Um, we're gonna let him go too and his colleague. So so, so, Mr. Warden, if there's, if there are, I mean, uh, some people I know, um, you know, one of the biggest fears is public speaking, uh, but you may have questions that you want to ask. Um, feel free to forward those questions to us, and we'll make sure that those questions get forwarded to the right place. <coughs> um, anyway, for, uh, and if you if you require that information, we'll we'll get um, we'll get email information on your way out as we take the five minute break. We'll give you uh, ways to contact us if you had any additional questions keeping in mind that you know council has brought EHS here to to talk about this issue it's it's not a it's not a, we're obviously not delivering this service but we felt it was important that we would bring this issue to light uh, for the residents I know that councillor Digden and councillor Dontremont certainly and and sorry all three and councillor Bork certainly certainly uh, made it very clear that they wanted to to put shine some light on the issue so and I believe Councillor, or Ward, sorry, Warden Donaldson as well. Uh, yeah, all, actually. <laughs> I don't know why I singled you guys out, but yeah. <laughs> you're all pretty pretty, pretty interested in having the, the light shine on it. So. I've been singled out before, and it's all right. Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Walker and Mr. Freer. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. dealt with our presentation so now at this point I think it's appropriate that we have a, a motion to follow up on this um, yeah so move second, second. Okay. Chris do you have some type of wording for that motion based on our earlier discussion yeah would you like to read that uh, <coughs> So I have uh, just moved by Calvin and seconded by Kathy to send EMC uh, a letter requesting the following information, uh, an updated follow-up time um, of service and data um, collected to base their decision of removing the, or changing the status. Yeah. Is that appropriate? Was there anything else that you wanted in terms of information? Uh, would like to say something? I would. Um, I think it would be important to have comparative data. So okay. if you if you ask for data, they'll give you data. But what you want is comparative data so that you can compare trends around calls. before and after kind of thing. Yeah. <coughs> or just yeah, just just comparative data based on how they accumulate. Yeah. Comfortable with that, council vote? Yes. Seconder. Yes, seconder. I'm the seconder. I'm fine with the motion. He's the first one. Oh, okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Okay, we'll move on to number four. Adoption of the minutes. Regular council meeting to September 12th, 2017. So move. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Audit committee meeting of September 25th, 2017. Second. Second. I have a question on the audit committee. Councillor, we have a Mover yeah, and a seconder. And mover seconder. Yes. Councillor Yi Thank you. Uh, I see. I saw in the uh, financial position is the three one one dash nineteen seventy nine. Oh. Is that supposed to be three million? No. One hundred and eleven oh. nine seventy nine. Oh, there's a nine too much. Last, okay. This last is last a question. Nine. I see in that. I'll correct that. Thank you. Okay, so the nine, so it's 311. So the financial position was 311, 197. Mm -hmm. And the budgeted deficit, and uh, I'm going to just add this and answer this. Yep. Uh, I kind of got mixed, mixed up a little bit. The budget deficit was $489,190. Didn't we budget last year for a break even? Yes. That's when we do our budget. Yeah. 
Can you explain to me your uh, hate the dry to me? No, abs no, absolutely. That's a great question, and that's a question you should be asking. So. So the, the cons first of all, this is the consolidated financial statement. So it is not just including your operating, your operations. We always budget a break even for operations. Yes. Uh, the difference, the major difference, is depreciation. So what we do is we do not, uh, we do not in our uh, operations, we don't show depreciation as part of the budget. So we don't fund depreciation. So so it's a non-cash number that's driving it into that position. So. So uh, don't be afraid. <laughs> we, uh, it is. It's because what we do instead is we transfer money to our reserve. We don't try to fund that amount of money. It's a, it's a paper. paper. No one said. Yeah. Really, that it, because it's a, it's it's yeah it's yeah. yeah. What you call that? <laughs> amortization <laughs> or depreciation of yeah. our tangible assets. You certainly answered the question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Okay, we have a motion. With with uh, corrections that will be made, is that all right with the mover and second? Yes. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Committee of the whole meeting, September 26, 2017. Oh. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion carried. Now we'll go to business arising from the minutes. We already done some of that, so is there anything else? Anything you'd like to add there, CEO? Uh, there are some, uh, I think, I, I don't think so, no, not at this time. Um, I know that there's obviously some business arising, but um, I think it's addressed in the staff report. Okay. It's not for decision at this time. And that actual item will not open for me at this point. Okay, councillor's report will start from left to right. Glenn? It's past month, I could write a book. <laughs> no, 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 we'll keep her going. Thank Kathy? you. Nothing. Uh, yeah. Just one important one. Uh, the uh, liaison, or I guess it's not exactly liaison oversight committee. It's a new new board. The airport now has met recently. And I just wanted to let you guys know, the other councillors, that uh, just by, by I, I felt the feeling at this table that, you know, we want a more... Uh, how should I say this? Uh, reduced approach to the airport, you know, something that, that can be more economically feasible for, for us, but still not uh, limit limit the, the safety aspects of, of having flights in and out of the airport. So I'm really trying to push that message. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what the future holds. Obviously, there's a lot of tough decisions to be made there, but I just want to let you all know that I've been, uh, you know, pushing that point on, on our, our behalf. Uh, ultimately, any decision comes back here, obviously, but I uh, just wanted to update you on that. Good. Good. Thank you. Councillor Muse. Yes, uh, I, I attended a, a Dark Sky meeting and it was brought up about street lights, whether or not we're in contact or is, is no social power aware of, of uh, uh, like the, the temperature of the lights, whether or not, it, or, or should we be in contact with them to let them know that, that maybe in this area that, that they could have a, a reduced uh, uh, I think it's called temperature, light temperature, light something. It's 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 less. Like it's it, it's yep. not going to be as bright. Right. But still, we'll do the the. Uh, now, when we became uh, uh, through uh, UNESCO, did we not discuss that at some point that? It's not in our bylaws. It's not in our. We we don't have anything on that. And they just wanted me to bring it up to see if there was any way that we could educate the uh, the uh, uh, Nova Scotia Power on that issue, if ever they replace lights or whatever. So uh, um, we're in the process uh, to to answer your question. We don't have a bylaw right now that restricts the light, you know, uh, brightness or how it's aimed or yeah. all of those things. Uh, that is required if we are seeking to protect uh, our dark sky and uh, we I, I can't confirm whether we have contacted Nova Scotia Power and said look we're in the starlight designated area we should be considering you know etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I don't think they've been informed I think our strategy was to do the bylaw and then say okay Nova Scotia Power here's our bylaw um, but certainly nothing stops us from contacting uh, people from Nova Scotia Power mm -hmm. saying that we intend on putting a bylaw yes 
and, and uh, I do believe that the committee is also going to write to uh, uh, no social power to integrate, you know, like, like just make them aware of what, what our, our designation is. Right, okay. right. So certainly we have uh, uh, one of the projects, and I'll remind all of council uh, of this, one of the projects that we had the Dalhousie uh, Management Without Borders group uh, working on was to help us with what a bylaw might look like for okay. Dark Sky. So we do have the beginnings of, the by of a bylaw. Uh, this bylaw doesn't exist anywhere in Nova Scotia, so we can't steal it from anyone, so we have to create it. And we will. And I think, uh, you know, we, we haven't set ourselves uh, internal deadlines, but, you know, from our perspective, we'd like to see that happen before next fiscal so that we can bring that to council for your consideration. Okay. Is that it then? <coughs> Councillor Surratt. Uh, just a few things uh, that I attended the, uh, the uh, committee that came down for the Acadian writings at the Club Panama Ball and made a small presentation uh, on my behalf. And uh, uh, it was, uh, there were some good comments and I, I must, must tell you that I was quite proud of uh, Alain and, and Danny going there and put the views of our council uh, to this committee. Hopefully they'll report uh, back to their peers and, uh, you know, uh, maybe make some influence there. Also, uh, I, I uh, participated in a two-hour teleconference on rebranding the UNSM. Their name, their, uh, what they stand for, it was, uh, it was from all over the province. It was, like I said, a teleconference and uh, they even put us in groups. I, th I thought it was well. Well, man, on, on a telephone. How do you get into groups? But uh, it worked well. We all had input from all across the, uh, the province, and I guess a report probably back at the UNSM. I got a few other things, but uh, that's it for now. <coughs> Councilor Nicole? Yes. Uh, busy. Hallwood. Busy month. Hallwood. <laughs> All tired. Hallwood. 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 Mr. Donaldson. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go through everything. It was a busy month, a lot of different meetings, a lot of different committees. Um, some of the highlights, I was in attendance for the grand opening of the Wedgeport Trail, um, where they, they showed their platform for deep sky observation. They had the, um, the lens out. It was very well attended. It was an excellent presentation. Um, also, I've, in, I've been involved in a couple of groups for um, community engagement for the new municipal building. So I went to the first meeting that they had at Ecole Paramba, but I also was invited to the 25 to 40 group, which I'm really not, but I was, <laughs> I was invited anyway. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but I found what I found interesting is that that group, their ideas of what they would like to see in the municipal building was similar, quite similar to what I heard at the other public engagement meeting. So I noticed in the staff, um, in the staff report that there's another public engagement meeting October 26th. W wasn't it originally a different date? It was. Okay, so it, it was the 12th, wasn't it? It was. Okay, so it was changed to the 26th. Okay, whoops, good. Um, that's important to get out there, I think. Uh, Mariner Center meeting, which a few councillors attended. There were actually five councillors there from Argyle, which was impressive to see. Um, we discussed the, the, pro the priority uh, of the expansion of the Mariner Center in that project, um, and Argyle was well represented, and I, it, I was really happy to see that. And it was a very interesting meeting, which we'll probably discuss at some point. Um, also, I just want to put a, a plug for the Yarmouth Athletic Awards Banquet that's coming up November 17th. So anybody who is out there in the public, we are always looking for people, to, nominations for Athlete of the Year, Male Athlete of the Year, Female Athlete of the Year. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, our bitch, coach. what's it? Coach, and um, what's the English referee. word? Referee, um, all those types of awards. So um, always anybody who's interested in making nominations, they can submit that to the Recreation Department. And that's all that I will say. Councillor Dion. Um, on September 23rd, I attended the uh, banquet for the, uh, the Bay of Fundy Sea Kayaking Symposium along with uh, Councillor Muse and former warden Elder Gontram was also invited. So it was nice to, uh, to go out. And again, they did a, a really good job. The weather this year cooperated probably a little bit too much because these, a lot of these guys are, and gals are extreme kayakers and uh, it, it was so nice and warm that uh, 
you know, almost, uh, almost cramped their style, but it was well attended. I think they were almost at full capacity, and the next one will be in two years. Two so years they're now. doing it every two years. So uh, again, the, the OR Galler uh, did a bang-up job with uh, the hosting, and uh, I'm sure you guys seen the, the kayaks on top of the trucks and the cars uh, driving around. People stayed, you know, extra days, and, you know, so it's great. People from all over the world, so nice to see. Thank you. Thank you. Move on to Warden's report. The only thing I can add is uh, I attended, uh, along with Councillor LeBlanc, the, the, the Wedgeport Fireman's Banquet, which was very enjoyable. Got to meet some old friends I hadn't seen in years. And one other informal meeting with Bay Ferries one morning with Pam Mood and Deputy Warden uh, Cunningham from Yarmouth. It was informal. He basically explained the problems they had had this summer with the engines and how that all shook down, and uh, but nothing earth-shattering earth for changes in what operations or anything like that. So it was just nice to be called and to attend something like that. So other than that, everything else is people have mentioned. So we'll move on to uh, staff report. Now I see I have. I must have to update this because I can't bring that up. So we'll turn it over to you while I play with my electronics. Okay, very good. Very good, thank you. Um, so I won't go through every little page here. You've had the opportunity to read it and for those who are watching <coughs> on television, www.monargyle.com, uh, there is a link directly link to the agenda and you could read the staff report uh, at your leisure. Um, if that is something of your interest. So uh, I will touch two, three things. One is the administration building. That's a priority, obviously, this year. Uh, Wild Salt Architectures presented the initial internal designs to staff and council. So we've, we've done a lot of back and forth, back and forth. Um, so it's a moving target a bit. And so we're, that's one of the reasons why we've pushed the meeting from the 12th to the 26th to give us all adequate time. Um, you know, our, our collective philosophy is you measure multiple times and you cut once. Uh, the plan is absolutely critical uh, because it's a lot more expensive to change your mind after than it is before any sort of tender drawings are done. So we're really like we're really looking at this over and over again. Uh, we've gotten great input from our from our municipal building uh, committee as well as staff and council. And so um, certainly before the 26th, you'll get another crack at looking at the revisions and, and hopefully there'll be more information on what the exterior is going to look like uh, at that time because they didn't have that at that time. I doubt that I will see a bulldozer or an excavator there this year, or maybe next year. Uh, if you see anything, if, if anybody sees anything on that property, it would be us cutting down trees that are not required, like a lot of like that minor brush work that we, that some of our maintenance people are trained to do. Uh, we'll do some of that if there is any other uh, clearing of, of that sort of like removal of 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 the uh, roots and stuff like that like that might happen uh, prior to, to the spring this will the the the, the tender is going to go out in the spring so it'll be like so if anybody's wondering you know when is the construction going to start well that we're not sure of we know the tender is going to go out in the spring and we hope to have it completed by November. That's the question on your line of the right. Yeah. You know when the tender is going out. Then tender is going out, and we're hoping to get it out at the early stages of the construction season. So that and and we'll say that multiple times so contractors can can know that this is coming, and uh, and that and you know hopefully it'll be a job that that uh, that gets a lot of competitive bids. Uh, so again, the second public meeting to show the draft design will be held on October 26th at 6:30 at Ecole Secondaire de Paramba may not be in the library room, it might be in another room to accommodate uh, more wall space because they'll be showing renderings mm -hmm. and pictures. So just so that you know. Uh, Airport Corporation, um, so with the audited financial statements were approved at the last meeting and um, uh, the board is focused on uh, the infrastructure requirements of the airport. We're in, you know, we're pretty much everything at the airport is at the end of its serviceable life. So we have to make decisions as to what, what is absolutely important for this community. Uh, the board has obviously uh, has concerns about uh, health services, ironically. Uh, today, we've heard a lot about that. And so uh, Medevac, for instance, you know, requires that, that airport and requires certain things to be at the airport in order for it to land its fixed wing operations, as well as its helicopter operations. So that is a priority 
of this board. It's not the only priority. There are other economic development opportunities. There's a lot of chartered flights that come in and out. And so while we don't have regular passenger service, you'd be surprised how many passengers actually come and go uh, from the airport. And, uh, so if, and so the work around this now is what is the right size of the airport based on our region? And, and, uh, and the federal and, municipal and, and provincial governments really need to st step up and help us on this one because we're at the end of life uh, from an infrastructure perspective and that can't land entirely on municipalities uh, to pay for. We know it's a, it's, it's a big investment. And we also know that it's a regional priority. Uh, uh, Mr. Warren, if you don't mind. Go uh, just a quick question on that. Uh, uh, I, maybe Lucy might know the answer also. Mr. Fields, or the manager, I can just put a name here, was, had sent a letter, I remember it was a meeting, in March, February, March. It was supposed to be done at the end of October. Mm -hmm. Is that letter still in effect? Or is he staying on for a day? But you remember there was a letter sent yes. that it was going to be done. So, you know, and is he staying on then? We're anticipating that the manager's last day will be the end of November. Okay. Uh, so, um, I, don't, I won't go too far in the detail, but... but uh, but, but basically, um, the idea was that that would give appropriate time for somebody transitioning, transitioning into some of the projects that are required. So the CEOs have already had a conversation about, okay, well, what does that mean for the airport? Do we hire a manager? Do we not? How do we deal with that? So our strategy has been threefold. One is, uh, you know, if there are engineering services that are required, I mean, this, the, the, if, if there is a project at the airport to be done, it requires engineering services, and the town is is willing and able to provide that service. Uh, there's also the the issue of of um, uh, HR management moving forward, so that we're still working on, and um, uh, we are looking at you know accounting services and what does that look like. We're also engaged in uh, contacting uh, the Port Hawkesbury manager, uh, which we have had contact with. But I think uh, what we want is to have him come to Yarmouth and tell us, you know, how things are working in Port Hawkesbury. They they run an entirely different ship uh, in Port Hawkesbury, and so I think it would be beneficial for us to understand what that looks like. Because up until three weeks ago, we were operating as if we were running a passenger service, 24/7 service. Uh, we we know that that's no longer the case. So the 301 certification matches the certification of Port Hawkesbury. And so, um, so the question we ask ourselves is how, how are we different from Port Hawkesbury now? And, and how are we the same? And what do we need to do to adjust our operations? Thank you. That's so great. That's, great information. that's our strategy moving forward. We're, it's an ongoing conversation. Good. Right. So part of that strategy will be staff. Uh, we anticipate that the staffing uh, requirement and the recommendation will come from the existing manager. And so if there are additional adjustments that are required, it would be done by the new manager. But part of his departure, part of his, his ask was, okay, look at the HR and infrastructure requirements, not just the infrastructure requirements. Okay. So, um, yeah, so uh, in terms of other work, uh, uh, that is taking my time. Um, I attended the AMA fall session. Uh, I was named president. Uh, you knew that was that was coming. Um, the the work changed almost instantly after that happened. So I'm hoping to to uh, to keep up. But <coughs> one of the projects of priority uh, for the AMA and for the province is this work around municipal modernization, and which which isn't amalgamation. It isn't dissolution. It is how do we how do we address some of our problems of our aging population and our reduced population. How does that get? How does that get done at the regional level? And what what's what needs to change for us to do that better? Um, so in some cases, it might be amalgamation and dissolution. Uh, in our region, I, I sincerely believe that is not, in fact, the case. Uh, but what is the case is we require uh, a higher level of regional collaboration, and that that's probably the truth across Nova Scotia. So. Depending on where you are, there's a lot of co collaboration or there's no collaboration. So we have a corner <coughs> that collaborates very well, but, but we don't actually make decisions collectively on some of the larger projects. So there are ways that we can improve. Um, and that's the end of, of where I would focus my time and energy. If there's any questions on, on, on my uh, part of the report or any part of the report, um, I'm happy to, to do my best. To answer any questions. Well, I just gonna 
I was just going to say uh, to the rest of the councilors, if there's anything else on the rest of the department's heads, uh, part of the report here, uh, Alan would do his best answer, but I guess he's already explained that. Is there anything? Again, it was a very thorough, good report. Yeah. Great. Other business. Request for tax relief. I have figured this out. I have all the attachments. So. It's an awful lot of money, Mr. Warden. How are we going to manage that? Move we'll approved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Second. <laughs> like I said, I thought I had it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. $3.36. Yeah. Just for the public knows. For the public knows how much it is. Okay, we have another RFP for the disposal system system replacement project, Group 5, Wedgeport Wastewater so Management District. So move. Second. Again, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. I can't keep up. Yarmouth. Town of Yarmouth priority set an invitation. Wasn't that for tonight? No. It, the uh oh no this is the joint council yeah. this yeah the, the other meeting i was thinking of was for tonight sorry uh no that's the same one that's number two first attachment is oh i apologize yeah. it's not yeah. the, it's not the same my apologies no. first attachment is the second finally you were drawn now we right. yeah <laughs> yeah that is correct so um, have we? Do we have a firm date on this? No, not that I see. Same here. I didn't see anything there with firm date. Are, are, are they just asking that we agree to, to meet and to discuss our priorities? Is it as simple as that? Well, when was the last one? June. So, so this this. Uh, invitation is to have Gord McIntosh. Right, so right. the town, the town hires Gord McIntosh to help them through their priority setting processes. We've never hired Gord uh, to do that, and and I don't think the municipality has either. And so what they're saying is, is, hey, you know, why are we looking at this only at the town? Maybe it would be useful to have a regional priority set, setting session. I imagine they'll still have their own priority set, setting session. So they're just, they're just, you know reaching out to us and asking whether or not we want to engage in that in that session um, facilitated by a third party. I mean, there'd be costs involved. We don't know how much, but he's already here, so he's typically pretty good around the around not charging uh, travel more than once. And this is not the same as our regional? Nope. No. No. Joint council meetings. That is, that is correct. Okay. It is not the same. Yeah. I'm really confused. So then, how is this? So they are two separate things. Then? Yes. Totally, it's completely totally different. Yeah. So it's not just me that's confused. No, no. <laughs> okay. So, okay. They're asking us to join them. Am I right so far? Mm -hmm. <laughs> In a priority setting meeting with this Gord McIntosh. McIntosh. And that's different than what we've been doing? Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's different. Okay. But I, I, it's different that it's facilitated makes it different, I suppose. Okay. Same um, conversation just with the facility. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you. not at all. I, I, that's what I got same, same type of yeah. thing we're just going to have a facilitator that's that, we I have, that we have to pay money for? Well, I, I would imagine that if we're going to use a collective facilitator that we would collectively pay. Okay for that service. Now, the priorities they discuss like may or may not be capital priorities, it could be operating priorities, could be you know, could be other priorities outside of the capital priorities. Okay. That we already set right. that we're not following, but that's okay. Right. Um, but that that's yeah. So that's Okay. Yeah. Councilor News first. Here's my here's how I saw this. Okay. When we this is not just to set the joint priorities. Okay. They hire this person, from what I understand, to help set their own priorities. Right. For sure. For sure. And they want to know, from what I read here, is they want to know if we want to join that, if we can if we can pick up any kind of information to help us set our own priorities. Okay. Which is not our joint ones, right? Okay. When we meet as a joint council, that's where we set our joint priorities. 
Am I correct? Lake Airport. Lake Airport, yes. whatever that we own together. But this one here could be, like you said, it could be uh, um, capital, could be operation, could be whatever, because they do that for their own priorities. Mm -hmm. They hire this guy. It says, and discuss regional priorities. Yeah. And discuss, and to discuss them as well. And discuss regional yes. priorities. If she stood the point there, it's about this is to discuss regional priorities. Well, it's there. It would be the perfect opportunity to say, yes, okay, again, <laughs> it could be both, yeah. Councillor Surratt. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, I'm interested in sitting down with the other councils at this point in time until maybe a few things are cleared up or to set up a meeting. I, I'd rather wait till after if we are fortunate enough to have a meeting of Joint Council on the 24th. I, uh, you know, I, I would certainly like to see what's going on on the next part of this, on this agenda here, on the next attachment. Uh, but I'd rather wait till the, we have a meeting on the 24th and, and, and talk about priorities, I guess. But uh, uh, at this time, I think if they, whatever they want to set, they go and do it. And, we want to set our own priorities, we, we work on our own, and, and we share a lot of services, and it doesn't mean that we won't, but we still have joint meetings, and we, sh we still will, but I said, I would think at the moment, let's, let's do our own thing, and uh, uh, you know, and share the services we do now. I mean, that'd be cost to this, no, it's not only the cost, it's, I don't know, it's, I'd rather not go there myself. You no feel more. like a, a meeting with just the three of us, I assume we've set it for the 24th? Okay. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and have the discussion there. And then go from then, there. Then go from there. Right. Because yeah. there's a lot of questions that have to be answered before I agree to this. Because right at this moment, I, I would say that I would not be interested at all with what's going on behind the scenes at the moment. But once maybe we can sit down and maybe iron out some of the questions we have, then I'd certainly be willing to. So do, should this. we have a motion to, to decline going to this, or is it should be a general consensus? What would be the best way? What I'm hearing is a motion to defer, uh, yeah. a motion yeah. to defer yeah. to, have the, to have the conversation as a collective rather than have independent decisions yes. around that. Yeah. That's so what I'm hearing. I'd like to make a motion that we defer this to October 24th meeting. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Aye. Motion carried. The next one, <coughs> award of an RFP for the no. Tusk. It, there's two. There's two attachments. The town priority set invitation. Uh, see there. Oh. Request for taxes project. Mentioned. No, I've done the town of priority yeah, invitation. There's two. See? There's another attachment. So, so this was, sorry, it, it, it might have been less confusing if we had it on two lines. It's, it's my, it's my apologies. It was, um, so, so this is, this is just a document, like the issue of, of, of missing the public meeting tonight uh, for the, the YARC and the location was raised by a couple of councillors. They wanted to bring that to discussion. So that's why this particular attachment is attached. So that's, it's, yes, it's about regional priorities. Um, and so, so this, this attachment just simply is information to support that discussion, which was raised uh, by some of our councillors uh, regarding the regional pri capital priorities we uh, approved in 2016. Back in January, yes, too. That was mm -hmm. almost two years ago now. Okay, so we will sort some of this out, I assume, on the 420. 24. I don't have that in my calendar. I got to write that down. Mr. Ward. Yes. Could I speak on that, please? Okay. On that, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Councillor Sweat. Uh, I'm going to maybe stray a little away from exactly what's put on this uh, on the attachment. I'll start first on with the question, which uh, when we were sent a uh, a uh, notice, I guess from from. Uh, <coughs> The uh, town of Yarmouth about the uh, there was a meeting tonight about their arts and culture center, which which they're moving forward to on uh, on uh, uh, the Brown Tree, uh, not the Brown Tree, Concrete Parking Lot, anyhow, according to what we're hearing, and uh, they were asking if we as councillors 
we were, they were inviting us to go and attend that, that meeting. And uh, one of the statements that uh, was on there by the mayor was, this project is of paramount importance to the entire region. Well, I tell you what, number one, myself, as far as going to that art and cultures meeting tonight, with what's going on, well, we had our meeting here, but even you had in a different day, with what's going on with town, the town and the yard, I don't think this council should put their nose into that until that issue is settled. And I don't know if we should send a letter to the town stating that uh, until this, the, the air is cleared up, uh, we don't want to get involved and get in the middle of whatever kerfuffle they're having. Uh, I don't feel that it's our place to go and be uh, take one side or the other. Uh, as one person uh, put on, I'm not going to name his name, counselor from another area, put on, he's not going to be brought into a place where it looks like he's supporting the arts culture or the yard board is there trying to put a yard at their current location on Parade Street. They're trying to put a place, the town that is, on Collins Street. I don't think as a council we should put our nose there. Whatever happens, let them settle it. Let's stand aside. Once they've got that settled, then yes. I say if they want to invite us, you know, I say it'd be fair. But at this point in time, I don't know if we should send a send letter or just leave it at that, that, you know, if, if the other councillors would like to speak on it, uh, that we just keep our hands clear. We don't want to set any, like this councillor said, any illusion that we're on one side or the other. And I open that to the floor if anybody wants to. Anything wrong with that? I agree. I agree. Sometimes I less agree. seat is more seat. So. Yeah. <laughs> you want that? Do you want the motion on that? Uh, I don't think we need a motion. It's, it's should we send a letter or should we shouldn't? No, it was just an ask. I guess is all she did was send an ask if we should want to attend. I think the fact that nobody is there tonight, well, we, even though we have a regular yeah, no. council meeting, is kind of a, you know, we didn't send any of our representatives, did we, or any of our staff, or so I think that's a, probably to a me that's message. a town that's a town priority. Yeah, exactly. It's not a regional priority right. until they get that sorted right. out. Then clear indication that we're basically keeping our noses out of yeah. there. Right now, so. Once exactly. they get their ducks in a row, well then. Yeah. Are we ready to move on, Kevin? No, sir. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. If you don't mind, no. I'll have one more thing, and I, I certainly like discussion on this. We had a, uh, there was a meeting, I said we had, there was a meeting of the uh, Mariner, uh, for the Mariner Center, the expansion of the Mariner Center, which was, as we see on, on the uh, regional priority, recommendation from the three units, which was an attachment uh, on our agenda. And uh, we see where our priorities were, and the Mariner Center expansion was number three on our regional infrastructure priority. I guess uh, where I'm going with this is that uh, where does the town fit with this? If the regional priority, which they voted on, there was a mover, and a seconder on this. Uh, in fact, one of the movers was uh, a counselor from, uh, from Yarmouth. Where are we going with this priority? If all of a sudden, at that meeting, let me go back, at the meeting that there was a five of us at that meeting of the Mariner Center expansion, and uh, the Mariner Center expansion, the committee was told, their board was told that it is no longer a priority, and they've moved to the Arts and Culture Center. So I guess my question to, to, to counselors is, uh, should we be, uh, have this on the agenda for the October 24th? After saying all that. I, I, think, I think it should be on that October 24th meeting as one piece of the agenda. I'm not saying I'm right in one, I'm saying, I'm saying I'm wrong. I'm saying we have to know where they stand. If this was a regional priority, and all of a sudden they've told the Mariner board, uh, no, 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 they say, this has gone, pushed off the side, we're pushing for the Irish Culture Center. Let's face it, uh, Mr. Colin Fraser, Mr. Zach Churchill, if they've got several things that the area wants, they've, we've been told enough times at these meetings, prioritize what you want. Don't jump into several things. Prioritize, get one or two. We get one, and we can push for that. 
So I would like to know from the other councillors if we could not put this on our October 24th on the agenda to see what our priorities are, where we're going with this, have they backed off, and if they have good enough, it's up to them. We just want to know, that's all. I leave that to the floor, see what you think. I certainly do we have much influence in setting that agenda? We do. Mm -hmm. So is it is it uh, <clears throat> is it agreed by council that we would like to see that on the agenda? I, personally, I do. But I, do. I think it should be Definitely discussed. Have to clarify yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Clarify. Yeah. But okay. It, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Daniel, you can comment. You can mention yeah. other one. As, as far as far as I can see, the every municipal unit has the right to change our priorities. And for them, the priority right now is, that is we know what the priority is. So we should probably have been notified that they were going to do that because we, we agreed as a group that this was going to happen. However, I don't think that we have a say in what the priorities are. I think they can change their priorities if they want to. Am I correct or am I not? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a, certainly every municipality has their own local priorities. I mean, you would never engage the town of Yarmouth to to give their input on your new municipal building, for instance. That is a local project that you do. I think it, it gets a little fuzzy when you're into a project that, if constructed, could be considered regional. Um, at that point, then, if the focus has shifted, so for instance, just like we would do, if, if we had a priority and it was uh, track, and field. track and field, and that was our number one, we would push hard to get funding for that particular project. So, so for us, what we've done in the, in the track and field instance is we've, we've said to, to the region, look, this is a priority. We've, we've taken it off the list of priority only because it wasn't as big as the others. But we said, like, the go, no go was if we could get 50% funding from the federal government or any other government, that we would go. That was, that was the decision that we made at the regional uh, comp discussion table, and that's a decision we continue to respect. Now, we're going to push for that funding, and we're going to do that because it is still a regional priority. When you're introducing new projects that are potentially regional, the risk is that if that becomes a priority of government, then all of a sudden you have two different views on what the regional priorities are. And I think that's, what, that's the piece that needs to be clarified. That's right. Is that, is that if it actually impacts in a negative way, airport, Mariner Center, or, or a, a ferry terminal, then you know, that is not only a town issue, it is a regional issue. And it becomes a conversation that we should have with our partners. But with respect, right? With respect, respect and dignity. Yeah. I'm not saying that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a battle, but it's it's a reminder that we have priorities regionally, and yeah. we've made that clear. Cool. Yes. Yeah. But but I, what what I what I would really like for the information to go out that the art center that they're talking about is definitely not a regional priority. That, that it's not a regional it's not a regional project. It's a town project, it, it's, right? It's right. never been discussed but, but as a regional no, project. Exactly. You're correct. But so, so that's what we have to, 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 to make people aware of, that, that this is not, we're not into this project with the town. That's and it. we shouldn't be. Right? We shouldn't be. No, no. it's there. And, and uh, because, like you said, uh, uh, CEO, that if it was a regional project, then perhaps we could lose on another regional project, but, but does it mean that if it's a town project that it's going to affect our regional ones? That's what I don't know. We, I we don't know that. We don't. We don't know that. But it's worth a conversation on the 24th. We'll have to be, yes. Yeah. I, I think it should be on the agenda. I think it has to be. Yeah, it has to be. It has to be uh, uh, brought up mm -hmm. yeah. on a regional basis. Maybe at some point we'll be asked to be part of that as a regional uh, project. Well, but we, 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 we haven't had the ask. No. So I don't, it seemed like it almost like was, we, they assumed that we was going to be part of that. It's the feeling I'm getting. That's right. Same here. Councillor Digman. Ah, thank you. The only thing I was looking at that is if, if it's decided to be a regional priority amongst two municipalities in a town and it's been voted on and agreed upon and motion carried unanimously for these priorities. And all of a sudden, 
whether it be a municipality or a town, want to change that somewhere in midstream, I feel as though they, out of respect, they owe it to be brought up at another regional meeting and say, we've changed what we want as a priority. And just not assume, being as though you change that the other municipalities or town will go on board. Whether it be the town, you know, coming up with it or us trying to do it to the town and another municipality, I, I just think out of respect that that should be brought up. And if it's decided upon as a regional uh, priority between the partners involved, it should be not decided upon as right. a regional priority no. with the partners involved. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you want me to make a some motion? more discussion, Council Surratt? No, sure. uh, you, you, would you want me to make a motion on that to put on the agenda? Is that how it should be done? Sure. Yeah. Yes. I'd like to make a motion that we uh, put on the for the October 24th uh, joint council meeting that uh, uh, for the uh, uh, Mariner expansion, or maybe I should say priorities, that would be a better word to put there. Regional priorities. Regional priorities. Regional priorities. Yes. Yes. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Cannot open page. I'm having trouble here tonight. Tusket maintenance shed expansion. Um, Would you like to take that? Sure, Mr. Warden. I can't get it open. That is, uh, that we had one bid, Garen Construction, 49969 plus HST, it's to expand our current uh, storage location uh, just down the road here in Courthouse. Uh, that's where uh, most of our public work storage is is being handled. Uh, the expansion is twofold. Uh, we need space, number one. Number two, we are utilizing the space so that we can load our equipment uh, and save about 40 minutes a day in terms of operation so that we can do that. We don't have to unload and load. Right now we have to unload and load uh, every day. So the expansion allows for a much more efficient delivery of service. It is within your budget that you have approved the capital, so I would recommend so we'll Second it. Any more discussion? And that, and that, that building will be there for, for use along with the new building. So Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. Just, uh, just wondering, do we know how many square feet this new building is? Uh, the expansion. The expansion. Uh, that's a good question. I'm, having, I'm not sure I have that right offhand. Let me just double check. You take the Uh, I can get that information before the end of the meeting, sir. So I'm just wondering, that's all. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I will get that information to you before the end of the meeting. So we have motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. The next one is 90 2017 fall grants to organizations for a lot. In, the, in approval, this is money we set aside for anybody that missed. <laughs> The grant process in the spring, and I believe we set aside 7,500, and we had a few grants. We all, I assume, we all got the form and we filled in what we would think would be appropriate for each grant re request. And we have the averages, and it totals up to $7,500. I move that we approve the averages of $7,500. I, se I second that motion. And uh, the grants for the were for cemeteries, farmers market, village friends, ladies auxiliary, and the daycare. Would you like to translate that for me? The very last one. Le jardin des petits. I believe that's daycare, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. The answer. Uh, Mr. Mr. Warden, the answer to your question, uh, Mr. Digden, was 429 square feet. Thank you, sir. And I am uh, sending you the tender documents. <clears throat> Thank you. You got it. We move on to number 10, correspondence. And for information, the town of Shelburne has a letter for a, a Dubler radar system which helps improve weather forecasting off the southern coast of Nova Scotia. We have a, we have a, a dead zone, if no better term. Uh, I have signed that letter and it's been sent off. Anybody would like to have any comments on that? Nope. 
I guess the pronunciation is it Doppler? How does it pronounce Doppler? Doppler. 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 A mute point that's been canceled. Yeah. And we have for the final report on last year's mixed curling championship. Uh, we had move on to financial requests. We have one that I have added tonight, and I mentioned it's for Drumlin Heights senior girls volleyball coach uh, Curtis Muse, and it's for hosting tournaments and purchasing equipment. It's basically the same letter as I got last year, and it was approved, so I would ask somebody so to make moved. a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion carried. Agenda topics for the next meeting? Hearing none, I'm sure there will be some. Question period. Questions are asked already. Junior? Motion is adjourned. <laughs> Ocean is adjourned. Is there anything? Oh, bath. Huh? What? I, 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 I